The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Addressing Challenges in the Management of Primary Biliary Cholangitis, Harnessing the Clinical Potential of New Treatment Approaches to Improve Patient Outcomes. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash PST860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Today we're going to be talking about primary biliary cholangitis, or what we used to call primary biliary cirrhosis, and what we'll refer to as PBC. This is a rare disease that you'll see occasionally in the primary care setting. And it's important that you understand this disease and how to make the diagnosis. In the specialty setting, the gastroenterologist will likely have several of these patients in their practice. And it's important to understand that there are new therapies out there and many more coming down the line. And it's very important that we understand the effective management of PBC. Now, PBC is a quintessential autoimmune condition in which there is loss of immunologic tolerance to a mitochondrial antigen, which leads to the destruction of biliary epithelial cells within the liver. With their loss, cholestasis develops and further injury to the liver, leading to biliary cirrhosis. PBC is a rare disease affecting predominantly women in their middle ages, though it can occur in women in their 30s. It's typically thought of being most prevalent in Northern Europe, but can be found in any ethnic group. And the prevalence of the disease is actually increasing over time in the United States, as well as other parts of the world. There's clearly a genetic predisposition to PBC. There's approximately a 60% concordance among monozygotic twins, and we frequently see some familial clustering of PBC in, in uh, individuals. Now, in individuals with this genetic susceptibility to PBC, there's likely an environmental trigger, such as uh, xenobiotics or chemicals, that lead to the loss of tolerance, an immune attack to the biliary epithelial cells, leading to this bile duct damage and cirrhosis. There's a general progression of the disease over time, from the loss of tolerance and the immunologic damage to the bile duct cells reflected in abnormal liver tests and elevation of the alkaline phosphatase, through the loss of the bile ducts and further cholestasis over time, leading to the fibrosis and symptoms of PBC, including pruritus or itching, fatigue, abdominal pain, and in the later stages, even jaundice. And finally, to cirrhosis, where there's liver decompensation with portal hypertension, variceal bleeding, ascites, and hepatic encephalopathy. Rarely there can be liver cancer, and ultimately all these things lead to the need for liver transplantation. Now the importance of identifying PBC early is that early diagnosis can lead to effective therapy, and we know from old studies prior to any therapies available for PBC that the majority of these patients would progress, and a large percent of them would lead to cirrhosis and the need for liver transplantation or die from their liver disease over the course of 10 years. There's also a small subset of patients with PBC that have a very rapid progression of their disease and can uh, lead to cirrhosis in as short as two years. Now, as we mentioned earlier, the typical manifestations of PBC are pruritus and fatigue and abdominal pain, but the majority of patients we diagnose today have no symptoms. They remain asymptomatic and are only identified by the presence of abnormal liver tests on routine biochemical testing. On physical exam, our patients typically will have a normal physical exam unless there are late stages of disease and they show signs of hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, perhaps even ascites and spider angiomata. If they have severe pruritus, they may have excoriations or severe cholestasis. We can sometimes see cholesterol deposits or xanthomas in the skin. Laboratory testing typically is going to reflect an elevated alkaline phosphatase consistent with the bile duct injury, but there can also be elevations of the AST and ALT, as well as the bilirubin in more advanced diseases. Now, our patients are typically going to also have a second autoimmune condition, and this is frequently Sjogren's syndrome or Crest syndrome. Patients frequently have Raynaud's disease and autoimmune thyroid disease. Less commonly, they may have autoimmune rheumatoid diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis or autoimmune hepatitis overlapped with their PBC, and a very small percentage of patients will also have celiac disease. Now, making the diagnosis of PBC is relatively straightforward, and there are three major criteria we look for. The first is evidence of biochemical cholestasis, that is, an elevation of the alkaline phosphatase. The second criteria is the presence of the antimitochondrial antibody 
or potentially of PBC-specific autoantibodies, including the SP100 or GP210. These are particularly important in patients that are AMA negative, which includes about 20% of our PBC patients. The third criteria is the histologic evidence on liver biopsy of non-suppurative destructive cholangitis with destruction of intralobular bile ducts, the hallmark findings of PBC. To make the diagnosis of PBC, we have to have two of these three criteria. And typically, the two criteria that are met are the biochemical evidence of cholestasis and the presence of an antimitochondrial antibody, or in some patients, the presence of these PBC-specific antinuclear antibodies, SP100 and GP210. Only about 10% of patients won't meet these criteria and therefore require a liver biopsy to make the diagnosis of PVC. Additional testing that sometimes is helpful is finding an elevated IgM. Uh, this is particularly helpful when there is neither the antimitochondrial antibody or PVC specific antinuclear antibodies, and the liver biopsy may be somewhat uh, indeterminate in terms of the diagnosis of PVC. Also on our differential diagnosis in patients that present with similar clinical presentations include drug-induced cholestasis, sarcoidosis, PSC, and other infiltrative diseases of the liver that sometimes can also cause elevations of the alkaline phosphatase. Now once we've made the diagnosis of PVC, what are the treatment approaches that we can take? Well, more than 20 years ago, the, only, the, the first uh, therapy for PVC that was uh, approved was ursodeoxycholic acid, also known as ursodiol. This is a naturally occurring hydrophilic bile acid that has cytoprotective effects to prevent further bile duct injury. It's dosed at 13 to 15 milligrams per kilogram daily in divided doses, and is very effective in most patients in slowing the progression of the disease and improving liver biochemistries. We also know from several studies that patients that achieve a biochemical response which can be defined in many different ways, but generally includes improvements or normalization of the alkaline phosphatase and bilirubin, that patients that achieve these biochemical response criteria generally do quite well and have a normal life expectancy. In particular, the GLOBE score is well suited to help us determine if an individual patient is likely to need second line therapies or do quite well on ursodeoxycholic acid. The GLOBE score used over 5,000 patients with PBC, treated with ursodeoxycholic acid for one year, and then based on the response and their biochemistries to this treatment, it estimates the transplant-free survival and compares it to a matched group of patients without PBC and tells us whether there's a statistically significant difference in their chances of survival. Those that don't meet this criteria then may be candidates for second-line therapies. Other factors that we may want to, might want to take into consideration when deciding whether to go to second-line therapies include patients with more advanced histologic stage of fibrosis on a liver biopsy or other signs of advanced disease. Uh, the presence of antinuclear antibodies have also been associated with worse prognosis, as well as younger patients uh, that tend to be less responsive to ERSO and have a more aggressive disease. Among the patients in our clinic that don't have an adequate response to ursodeoxycholic acid or lose responsiveness to this therapy, we should be thinking about several other factors that may be contributing to this lack of response. First, are there barriers to adherence to therapy? Those barriers may be related to side effects of the medication, including loose stools, hair loss, or cost of the medication. We want to confirm that they're on the adequate dose of ursodeoxycholic acid, particularly if they've gained weight and now need a higher dose of medication. We should also be thinking about comorbid liver diseases, such as fatty liver disease, which is very prevalent in our populations and usually can coexist with PVC. For patients with pruritus, we also want to be sure that if they're taking a bile acid resin, such as cholestyramine, that they're separating the taking of that medication with the ursodeoxycholic acid by at least four to six hours to avoid the binding of the ursodeoxycholic acid. Now, if we've addressed all of these issues, then we should be considering second-line therapy with uh, other medications, particularly obeticolic acid. Now, obeticolic acid is the new therapy we have available for the treatment of PBC patients. It's indicated in combination with urso deoxycholic acid in adults with an inadequate response or as monotherapy in patients that can't tolerate urso deoxycholic acid. Obeticolic acid is an agonist of 
the Farnesoid X receptor, FXR. And FXR is a very interesting protein which acts as a receptor naturally for bile acids and regulates their synthesis and uh, homeostasis. And so by activating FXR, a beta-colic acid reduces the bile acid load in the liver and thus leads to improved biochemistries in PBC. A beta-colic acid was tested in two phase two trials of PBC and shown to be effective both in combination with ursa deoxycholic acid as well as monotherapy for patients with PBC. These results led to a phase three trial of a beta-colic acid called the POI study among patients with PBC who had an inadequate response to ursa deoxycholic acid. In this study, patients were randomized to one of three arms, including a placebo arm, a 10 milligram of a beta-colic acid daily arm, and a titration arm of a beta-colic acid in which patients were started at five milligrams daily with the option to titrate to 10 milligrams after six months based on the response of therapy and tolerability. The response criteria included a reduction in alkaline phosphatase to less than 1.67 times the upper limit of normal, or approximately 200, along with a reduction of at least 15% and a normal bilirubin. Based on these response criteria, patients in the placebo arm achieved this endpoint only 10% of the time. Among patients treated with the beta-colic acid, either at the 10 milligram daily arm or in the titration arm, 47% and 46% of patients achieved this response. In general, a beta-colic acid was well tolerated. There was some pruritus associated with, with its use, particularly in the 10 milligram arm, leading to some discontinuations, but otherwise was generally safe and effective. Based on the biochemical response of a beta-colic acid in this study, it's estimated that there is a significant reduction and complications related to PBC including decompensated cirrhosis, liver cancer, liver transplants, and liver-related deaths. So currently, obeticolic acid is recommended or approved for the use in patients with inadequate response to ursodeoxycholic acid or intolerance to ursodeoxycholic acid, and we start in our patients with five milligrams daily, titrating to 10 milligrams after three months of therapy based on response and tolerability, and continuing at that 10 milligram dose. Now this dosing is appropriate for patients all the way up to child A cirrhosis. Once patients develop decompensated cirrhosis, we have to be careful about the dosing of a beta-colic acid. It's recommended that it only be given five milligrams once weekly in patients with child B or C cirrhosis. Other options for the treatment of PBC that are currently not approved but have been investigated include the fibrates, which are PPAR agonists. In particular, bezofibrate, which is a pan-PPAR agonist and has been studied in Japan and Europe, recently reported results on a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial showing that there was significant efficacy of bezofibrate in this group of patients with PBC who had inadequate responses to ursodeoxycholic acid. However, it should be noted that several patients did develop some hepatotoxicity with bezofibrate. Now, bezofibrate is not available in the United States, but phenofibrate is. This is not the same drug as bezofibrate, and it is an agonist only for the alpha isoform of PPAR, and there's limited data on its efficacy in PBC with just some case series being reported. Other options include budesonide, uh, which has also been reported to have some improvements in alkaline phosphatase. However, there are concerns about the use of corticosteroids in this group of patients who are already at risk of osteoporosis and osteopenia. In particular, fatigue affects most of our patients with PBC, and it's multifactorial, and we don't understand the underlying etiology. But we should actively seek out other causes of fatigue in these patients, particularly anemia and hypothyroidism. For those patients in which we can't find a secondary cause of this fatigue, treatment options are very limited. One particular option we might try is modafinil, a stimulant used for narcolepsy, but in placebo-controlled trials, it really hasn't shown much benefit and does have some adverse effects. In addition to fatigue, pruritus is also an issue for our patients. Anti-exchange resins such as cholestyramine are usually the first line of therapy for patients with pruritus. However, this is not very well tolerated and really has limited efficacy. Second line therapies include rifampicin, and when administering rifampicin, we should remind our patients that they may note that their tears and urine turn orange so that they are not upset by this side effect of the drug, though it can be effective. 
Other options, including oral opiate agonists and sertraline, are available for trial if needed. Sika syndrome is also common in our patients, and measures such as artificial tears, over-the-counter saliva substitutes, and pilocarpine are usually the therapies that are found to be most effective and tolerated by our patients. Once our patients are in a stable medical regimen, their monitoring should occur every three to six months with liver biochemistries. We should also keep in mind the other uh, medical conditions that are associated with PBC, including hypothyroidism, so checking a TSH every year may be helpful. Uh, these patients, as noted, also at risk of bone mineral disease, and so a, a bone densitometry every couple of years may be helpful. They're at risk of having fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies, particularly in those with more advanced disease, so checking their vitamin A, D, and E levels, along with supplementation, is important. For patients with more advanced liver disease, particularly those that have cirrhosis or near cirrhosis, an upper endoscopy to evaluate for the presence of varices and the need for prophylactic therapy to prevent bleeding should be considered. And patients with very advanced disease and cirrhosis may also be at risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, and so surveillance with ultrasound every six months should be considered in those patients as well. So PBC is a rare but important liver disease that should be considered in the differential diagnosis of any patient that presents with cholestasis. Once we've made that diagnosis of PBC, treatment with uh, ursodeoxycholic acid is effective in the majority of patients, but second-line therapies such as obeticholic acid should be considered for any patient with an inadequate response to ursodeoxycholic acid. And finally, symptoms of fatigue and pruritus remain challenging but should be actively evaluated and treated to improve the lives of our patients. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash PST860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Intercept Pharmaceuticals, Incorporated. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute, Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.